day uh, with with all of you and actually to to join uh, this July on a very important topic of application of AI and ML in business. Together uh, with me, there are great engineers and business mavericks, Natalie Daly um, from Serbia and Khalil Jablon from, from France. They will tell us more about their business path and the current use cases of application of AI and ML in business. I will like to shortly introduce them. Um, Natalie is an independent consultant, former board member, chief technology IT and transformation executive with 20 years of experience in telecom se sector in mul multi-country setup and multicultural setup, I dare say. Um, so it's, it is great to have um, with us a woman who inspires a lot of uh, people of all generations, both her peers and, and people who are just starting out in IT technology. And I thank you once again for joining us. Um, Natalie, thank you for inviting me. Natalie has been dealing with both technology and IT strategy and operations, as well as digital transformation of the companies. Um, and what is exciting and where you can follow more of her work is to great platforms, uh, 5G Talks and Data Sun Serbia. Through the, those communities, uh, she's focused on uh, showcasing how technologies such as 5G, IoT, and AI can improve the quality and productivity, productivity of people engaged in work and quality work of life, as well as we solve the social and environmental problems that humanity is facing. What uh, many of us find inspiring about Natalie is that she acts as an evangelist, strategist, and business translator of these technologies. So she not only understands them, but she also helps others adopt them. Uh, she helps companies and public to find right ways to use those technologies, and she points out both opportunities and challenges that those emerging tech, tech solutions can be uh, bringing upon us. And she's always fostering open uh, discussion. Um, so I'm, we have all the preconditions for exciting talk today, I, I would say. Um, and from France, from her lovely uh, environment, a cozy, cozy home, uh, Kulud opens also uh, the doors to the world of technology. Um, she uh, is um, uh, engineer by, by education. She holds an engineering degree from Tessie in Paris. Uh, she's currently working at consultancy firm AI3, uh, where she's leading efforts in establishing AI strategies and building solutions for clients. Um, what is exciting about her work so far, not only does she have the technical experience, she is also very involved in community. Uh, she, um, she is um, an award-winning event planner for TEDx Strasbourg 2014 and Young uh, European Council 2015. In her, um, so she's very driven about community uh, environments and uh, helping others succeed as well. Uh, her core expertise is information systems and she has vast experience in data analysis and project management. She will a bit, tell us a bit more about that later on. Um, I would uh, kindly ask our participants, uh, our, our attendees, to to remain on on um, on mute, and also when maybe it's convenient that when when one of us is talking, uh, that other people are are not not uh, just disabled sound, so that we ensure we have seamless uh, technology. Um, okay. Um, so let's start with the first question. Uh, I would also, of course, because we uh, plan to have one hour of discussion, let's let's have the, we will leave some time for our audience to also talk uh, to us. So I would like to start with Natalie, who can tell us more about the current state of AI and ML in 2020. When it comes to telco, like mobile first experience, what, what, what do you see? right now happening? Uh, 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 thank you, Milena. Uh, this is a great question to start. And I was thinking a lot about this uh, 
uh, in uh, recent uh, months. And uh, we all have smartphones, more or less. I think that we don't even talk about mobile phones anymore. We are talking about smartphones. And these uh, devices are like some kind of access point uh, for us to engage with the world, uh, with our friends, family, work environment. Uh, they are our window for entertainment world and unfortunately more and more to for health services as well because uh, especially now in this time uh, in the last couple of months when we have uh, 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 this uh, uh, coronavirus epidemic uh, so uh, what we do not realize often and many users do not realize that many of applications they are using as well as the device itself are already enhanced with AI and machine learning algorithms. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, implementation of AI technology is often in the background and not even visible to end users. So we are not aware of it. Uh, let me just share a few examples. For instance, uh, uh, your, your smartphone has a lot of sensors, uh, GPS, microphone cameras, and all these sensors are collecting data, which are now uh, uh, getting ready for AI algorithms to use. And you have AI uh, in cameras, you have AI in Siri and other voice assistants. You have Google Translate, which is powered by NLP, which is AI technology. Uh, you have a lot of search engines, uh, search of images, which is also powered by AI technologies. Uh, so, so we see that it is everywhere around us and that uh, we are already getting quite familiar with it. And, the, and furthermore, uh, the devices uh, have now uh, smarter and smarter hardware and microprocessors and chips that actually have AI capabilities so that you can do fast and efficient calculations of different AI and execution of different AI algorithms. And for mobile devices, this is very important from two reasons. First is customer experience, this mobile first experience that you mentioned, because customer to, customers nowadays want instant gratification, which means everything immediately. So it has to be fast. But on the other side, it has to be efficient because you, we have problems with battery life. We want long battery life. So we need some uh, hardware technology uh, that is supporting this kind of uh, algorithms. And that is already present in our mobile phones. Apple, Huawei, Samsung, Google, everyone has this kind of, this kind of technology. So, uh, so in my opinion, the whole, the whole uh, 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 mobile world is actually being built around AI and is being enhanced by AI, and I think that it will go even further that all these capabilities, both on hardware and software level, will be embedded in uh, all IoT devices in the future or, or most of IoT devices. So this is where I see things are going right now in 2020. Thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot for giving us background of how it looks like inside our phone and what it means for us. Before I actually um, ask a similar thing to Lewis, I would like to ask, ask you, uh, what is your, your attitude on um, instant gratification and how, how the mobile, sometimes mobile experience is designed? Like, how do you feel about it as a user? Do you feel that kind of affects your attention or like you don't want that? Maybe you wanna... Well, I am very impatient. I, uh, that is, <laughs> yeah. You, you, you uh, this is really a, a, a on point question. I am very mm -hmm. impatient. And uh, with the years, as the speed of internet increased, I, I uh, stopped being tolerant to anything. So I expect everything immediately. So I'm very bad when something is not working instantly. So uh, I am one of those people that obviously is uh, is uh, uh, finding this useful although i think that we should uh, find ways how to disconnect 
Uh, that yes. is something yeah. which maybe is not directly connected to this topic, but uh, I also think that uh, it's not always good to to act like that. So I'm not recommending that. I think that we should try to find a way how to relax and not always require instant uh, gratification. Yeah, yeah, thank you. But what you're mentioning is actually two different things, like bandwidth uh, and like reliable network. Yeah. Being impatient about that, it's like having a standard. But some apps using our impatience is totally different. As you said, disconnecting is something that yeah. maybe maybe is definitely a topic for, for, for some other occasion. Thanks. Um, Khalid, I would like to hear from you, uh, from your experience as, as a consultant working with companies, how, how, how does it look like when it comes to your perspective on the state of AI and ML? Where, where do you start? Yeah. So artificial intelligence has made a lot of us in the mobile app development industry. As we know, it's cheaper. We have more available screens. Uh, it's easy to access information in real time. And the data robust analysis, like uh, Natalie has said, uh, it's more and more powerful. And what I noticed with our clients is that Clients prefer to have this technology at the palm of their hands, uh, have uh, to access the information very easily, very fast. Uh, we have so many uh, apps that are very uh, expanding worldwide because uh, it's only a version, like an app version, a mobile app version, and uh, it's going very well. Uh, like for example, Yuka, that you can scan a product and you can see the composition of this product, whether it is cosmetic or it is food, and you can see the composition of it and whether it is good or not for your health, and then you can decide on the instant if you want to buy this product or not. Uh, we have another also uh, success story, which is uh, the app called uh, Too Good To Go, which actually enables customers to uh, connect with restaurants and stores that have a surplus in food or unsold food. And you can, in the day itself, decide to buy very good quality food uh, via the app very instantly very rapidly without uh, any problem so there's more uh, inclination into going uh, into having this technology uh, developed in mobile but uh, it also depends actually if uh, this app interferes with your uh, sensitive data if it does uh, i notice that clients would not uh, download this app very easily. They would like uh, to keep their security and their sensitive data to themselves. So it depends really on the app and how it is developed. Uh, and uh, have you noticed in your work so far, do some technologies, do some in industries need those technologies more global, more rapidly now, especially due to global pandemic? Um, yeah. Can you tell us more about that? Like what, what industries are, uh, if clients from some particular industries come to you and ask uh, solutions based on AI and ML more frequently than, uh, than others? It's more uh, in retail, because uh, in retail you can just take a picture of the product. Uh, you don't have to know the name of the product. You just take a picture and see uh, where it's stored at, uh, if there is another similar item that you should buy or other customer bought when they bought that item uh, at the same time. Um, uh, there's also in health sector, now it's becoming more adaptable, especially after the pandemic, there's a lot of uh, um, health, like how, how do I say, um, hospitals and even um, companies that are specialized in, uh, in, in, tech, in clinical uh, solutions that uh, ask for us to develop uh, more applications in uh, those fields using whether uh, computer vision or um, even robotic uh, automation process uh, for them to gain more, more time uh, in doing some tasks. Uh, 
Um, and uh, Natalie, maybe you can add if you had uh, yeah. experience where you maybe read recently or you encountered that some uh, more AI sh sh shape capable of shaping it with AI. Uh, well, I think that uh, 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 right now we can see the trend of uh, companies think, uh, uh, thinking how to become uh, more efficient. Uh, so it was present before, but this pandemic uh, put a lot of pressure of uh, many service industries, for instance, telco industry, but not only telco, all oil and gas also, uh, other sectors as well. Uh, so they are trying to find ways how to uh, make their work uh, more efficient, how to do more predictive and preventive maintenance, because now they have problem with uh, sending teams to do the work because of the, all the problems with, uh, with uh, social interactions and the need to reduce social interactions. And that is now uh, speeding up implementations. I would say that this trend was present, but now is accelerating due to pandemic. And especially this, uh, this uh, uh, industries where, uh, we, where we have critical infrastructure, I would say like that like uh, energy sector, oil and gas, uh, uh, telco sector, uh, uh, utility sectors also. So we will see there uh, more and more AI, especially in, this, in uh, these areas uh, where they can improve uh, their efficiency and where they can automate more things. Of course, health sector already mentioned before. Uh, Yeah, if I may add to that, actually, there's also in travel industry, uh, it should be more implemented, actually. Uh, especially, as Natalie said, uh, we want to eliminate as much as possible the physical uh, interactions. So if we have, for example, boss that can answer simple questions like where, where my gate is at, uh, how do I register my luggage, etc. So uh, that can help um, reduce as much as possible the, uh, the spread of coronavirus. Also in education, I think in education, we, we have to think about how to make uh, stronger networks uh, in order for everyone to be able to access mm -hmm. uh, the platforms. Uh, also uh, having training for people who are uh, not necessarily at first uh, uh, in corporate, like use the technology in their to daily jobs, like for example, nurses, if we want to think about how to um, evolve uh, in the health sector, I think some trainings to these people uh, and sectors have to be uh, provided. Yeah. And that, uh, if I may add something, because now it dropped my mind. Uh, we will see more AI connected to IOTs, to internet, uh, internet of Things, because we will see the proliferation of uh, IoT networks and services, and these networks will, uh, and sensors will collect a lot of data, and that will require a lot of uh, intelligence to be processed. So uh, it will be also connected to this kind of services. So we should not look at only standalone AI applications, but we need to look at them as a part of the a new ecosystem where you will have critical infrastructure, critical services like uh, education, like remote conferencing, like we have, like uh, robotics for some, uh, some uh, in some cases, uh, a lot of sensors, and then at the end, a lot of data that will be uh, processed uh, uh, by uh, many new AI applications. This is definitely, definitely uh, rising now and speeding. Acceleration is present. Thank you, thank you, thank you for, for um, clarifying actually how it will look like in the future. Uh, Natalie, can you can you share with us to which extent is technology ready uh, that should enable AI and ML, and to which extent are users prepared to adopt AI and ML? If you can, maybe we can make a distinction between business users or end, end users, but let's, let's talk about yeah. you know, technology versus people. Yeah. Mm. Uh, 
technology and yeah, well, <laughs> yes uh, yeah we mentioned customers customers at, at the, uh, i will start again with customers because for them it is more or less seamless it should not always be like that because i think the customers are not thinking enough about uh, their data and how they engage with different applications and algorithms but i will not uh, go there there now uh, you know uh, many people when you say ai have immediate uh, uh, pushback uh, because they do not understand that there is no general ai and i do not believe that there will be general ai uh, that will solve everything for many many decades and and who knows uh, whether we will see something like that uh, for our, in our lifetime we are talking about narrow ai narrow ai applications we are which are addressing certain AI tasks. So certain tasks are, can be uh, addressed through some of AI technologies. And we have AI a range of technologies from machine learning, deep learning, neural networks, different, different types of algorithms uh, which are, are being used. We have NLP in very big usage. In Serbia, NLP is still not so present because it is very hard to create good uh, NLP libraries from the language that can be used so we don't have many implementations but if we look at english uh, speaking uh, uh, areas and the applications that are supporting english nlp is quite advanced i mean we have it everywhere i'm using it uh, uh, google translate almost every day i'm using it uh, with alexa so i'm uh, uh, surrounded with these technologies all the time uh, so i would say that we have a lot uh, and uh, possibilities to implement uh, many uh, 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 AI technologies in many of the use cases in businesses. The question whether uh, organizations are ready for that is another question. On one side, I think that there are not enough competencies and culture in companies that is supporting using, using developing and using AI. On the other side, I think that there are also uh, challenges on management level on wh what, uh, 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 what and how uh, to start uh, uh, implementing in some business processes uh, AI. These are big questions that need to be addressed in, in, every, in every company. So at the end, it is less about technology and it is much more about uh, or culture, organization, knowledge, partners that you choose with whom you're developing things, change management, which I think is very, very important, and many other, many other aspects. Thank you, definitely. From my experience, I can also tell change management is such a huge part of digital transformation. Not to mention when you actually need to adopt a bit unknown technology, which is AI and ML, which is quite, quite mystical for many people. And I would like to hear from Kolud, like how it how it looks like in real life. Yeah, maybe if you can share uh, a bit from working with your clients. For example, when you help them implement um, these technologies, um, what solutions do you provide for them? I, I'm I'm aware you cannot tell us all the details, but maybe uh, just how your discovery phase look like. Uh, how do you assess their needs? Um, that's, that's a useful question. Well, first of all, they have to uh, present the problem uh, very simply uh, in order for us to know how to help them find a solution for the problem in, in, in that they have mentioned. So uh, in general, when I work with the C-level uh, managers, what they want uh, is to implement AI without even knowing sometimes what to implement. They want just to have to allocate the budget and they tell you, okay, we want to do this project and you will have uh, this uh, budget to uh, help us uh, figure out a solution that can help us uh, advance uh, in our business. So this is very um, broad. So I have to like help them find uh, the problem that they can solve. And sometimes I have to justify if the budget that has been allowed for this project is 
uh, justifiable. So for, for me, for example, when I go to a business, at first I see if they have this culture already uh, accepted uh, by their uh, employees uh, or not. Uh, so at first we uh, began by uh, implementing uh, chatbots, for example, to do um, to ask for a vacation from a manager to book a meeting or something like that and then we uh, do uh, robot process management uh, uh, automation sorry which is a technology that allows everyone uh, today to configure a computer or what we call a robot uh, that emulates and integrate actions of human uh, interacting with digital systems uh, to execute a business process. Like for example, uh, if a person is in charge of bills um, and they have to classify it by uh, company, by status, and then uh, according to status, they have to see if this uh, status is in uh, uh, progress or not. If it is in progress, they have to uh, contact the company in order to have uh, their input on the status of uh, the bill. So all of this, if it is done manually, it would take days and days and days. When it is done by a robot, it only takes a few hours. So, uh, of course, when uh, it is presented like that, some people are fearful from losing their jobs, uh, especially that now media coverage doesn't make it easy because when they present uh, AI, it's uh, whether euphoric or it's alarming. And and we have to uh, make sure that we explain that this technology is here to help you uh, gain this time in order to focus on another top like task that AI cannot do. Uh, because as Natalie said earlier, it's a narrow AI now that we have, uh, and it's not AGI, which is uh, artificial general intelligence. So uh, it is only doing tasks uh, to help you uh, gain time as much as possible. And now what is on the rise as well is custom vision, which is computer vision, uh, but it's called actually by Microsoft terms, uh, that is uh, getting uh, more and more adaptable in uh, companies uh, in order, for example, to help um, detecting an item and uh, saying, okay, this item is missing in this stock. We have to uh, restock it as soon as possible and get the notification uh, to, to the employee uh, as soon as possible. Uh, so eventually, like with now, with President Macron uh, enforcing this uh, AI mentality in startups and companies, it's becoming more and more adaptable uh, comparing to a few years back. Thanks for sharing the process and we will discuss a bit later the, the startup ecosystems and communities in our regions. I would like to ask both of you, uh, what happens, what, actually why projects based on AI fail? If you were lucky enough not to, not to work on a failed project so far, maybe you can tell us if you read about something related to what would be your estimation when you work with clients what you do so that the project succeeds or not fail. If you can share a bit, bit of that. Or maybe we overestimate what AI can do for us. Yeah. Uh, well, I think, uh, I think uh, that uh, uh, we already mentioned now both Kaluda and myself, some of the points uh, uh, there. I think uh, many projects starts like, uh, uh, with moonshot uh, desire, you know, they, uh, too too many, uh, uh, too they are too big and too complex. Uh, there is a lot of lack of management understanding and knowledge on top management understanding and knowledge. I mean, I I, I cannot believe that still I, I face uh, situations where some top managers think that by hiring few data scientists you will solve all business problems which will not happen. I mean, you can put whatever technology you want uh, there and, comp and uh, competencies and teams uh, uh, on one place. But first of all, you need to have good definition of business problem. And if you cannot define your business problem, it's not realistic that someone from outside will be able to do it. And if you define broad business problem, which is complex, 
you will you might not be able to address it so i think that 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 uh, uh, this is preventing uh, um, many companies to really embark on the journey because they actually need to create smaller steps they need to t start smaller tasks like mentioned before you know uh, uh, you start with chatbot but some simple uh, not everything in chatbot you know start with some smaller smaller uh, uh, task through chatbot and then build from it start with simple rpa and then add some uh, ai uh, to that and create intelligent automation don't uh, immediately go to uh, latest technologies and think that you can do everything uh, and one of the things which i think is preventing many projects also from being successful or at least is taking too long to do them is data which often is not cleaned oh, uh, so uh, dirty data is one of the biggest problems in every project which shows that there is no data structure data governance and data culture in companies and that is one of the big biggest problems and another thing is sometimes you just don't have data sometimes you have great idea everything is in place but you just don't have uh, e enough uh, enough data and last but not least our employees their fear of losing jobs is often uh, reducing their engagement and adoption rate later of the services if services are internal uh, uh, which uh, shows that there is poor change management uh, in the company. AI requires very strong change management because it's not it's affecting not only your customers, it affects your organization, your business processes, your people, and and uh, you need to take uh, care of that. So the, uh, in uh, I've witnessed all of these things uh, so far in my work. I was uh, all these things that I mentioned uh, at certain point in time. I I was uh, uh, dealing with them. Thank you, and thanks for being so honest. Then, like sharing like a real, I can see it like step by step approach will save us. I mean, it, it's a good guidance for everyone starting out in this field, and also more experienced colleagues. What would you say, Kulu, from your experience? Why yeah, I totally think? agree. <laughs> I totally agree with what has been said. Um, we have to present AI as uh, something that is going to help change our lives, um, mm -hmm. not as something that is threatening the extinction of humankind. Uh, because, well, actually the scandals that have happened recently, like with Cambridge Analytica, with, that harvested a lot of data, uh, millions of Facebook users, without their consent, um, make it, uh, make the algorithms uh, influence and manipulate masses on a large scale, uh, which made people fear a little bit uh, the adaption, adaptation of uh, AI in general and what it can do to their data. So for example, we have uh, this application that was developed for the pandemic in order to reduce um, the spread of coronavirus which called uh, Stop COVID. At first, many people were in, like, they wanted to download uh, this, uh, this application in the first polls, but eventually when it was ready, no one uh, did uh, download it because they didn't know how the algorithm works behind it. So eventually uh, it depends really on how you present your work, you have mm -hmm. to really tested a lot you have to ask a lot of questions from experts in order to know how to present your technology and in order to adapt the data in order to have something that works uh, according to the problem that was presenting and uh, and then eventually you present the product uh, to the customer for him to 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 test it but if you don't do all of those steps your ai and ml strategy will most likely fail. Thank you. We talked a lot so far about change management and adopting the right attitude to innovation. We have to follow that because I advocate that a lot. Technology is just a tool for us. Um, when it comes to helping out business executives, 
uh, what further education books or online courses would you recommend recommend to business leaders so that they actually understand better what AI can do for them and they can adopt actually uh, this kind of innovation in their companies? Oh, I, I have a lot of sources. <laughs> I think that uh, first of all, uh, so many things are uh, really available uh, now online and uh, I can really uh, recommend uh, uh, every business manager to uh, uh, take at least some of the trainings and invest a little bit of time because this will be technology that will change not only how we work but how we live. And it is very important. We need to understand it as business leaders, as managers, we need to really understand it uh, on the level of, of how it changes the world. And we need to help our employees uh, to cope with it. But uh, several uh, 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 sources which I can recommend is, first on LinkedIn, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, one uh, uh, Bernard Marr, uh, who is Futurist Strategic Business and Technology Advisor. He's really regularly sharing new developments in this uh, area. So I recommend following him. Really interesting, not only on AI, but uh, on IoT and other technologies topics. So it's very good to have uh, some overview. Also, uh, uh, you, uh, one can uh, follow Data Science Serbia. We are sharing there a lot of information uh, on new developments, not only for experts, but also for businesses for management. Uh, I recommend uh, Elements of AI. This is also an online uh, uh, course, uh, which is developed by University of Helsinki for European Union. And there is a plan on the level of European Union, as far as I know that by, I don't know which, in a year or two, that 1% of population uh, actually takes this uh, course, so uh, it's very easy. There is also a mobile app uh, to use it, and I think it's good for uh, everyone who has no knowledge. It's good to start with this. Uh, uh, there is also an uh, interesting uh, learning path uh, that Microsoft developed and offered for free, AI Business School, uh, uh, which it, it's, uh, I think it's good. Uh, it, it is not my intention to now pro promote Microsoft, but they did really uh, uh, a good selection and created paths uh, for in based on industry. So you can choose your industry and see a little bit more examples from that industry. And my personal favorite is uh, MIT Sloan Management School. I finished uh, artificial intelligence implications for business strategy there, and I can really recommend it. Uh, but, but that one is really serious training. That one is self-paced online, but you really need to invest time uh, to go through it, but it is valuable. It's valuable for, for uh, 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 business leaders. And currently I'm reading one book, uh, which is also uh, 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 published by MIT Press, the, A the AI Advantage, How to Put the Artificial Intelligence Revolution to work by Thomas Davenport, also professor, oh, and, and you, you read it already? Yes, I was going to recommend it actually, yes. Oh, well, you see, uh, great yeah. minds uh, think alike. <laughs> Double recommendation, yeah, yeah. And great to hear about MIT, they're, they're doing remarkable work, uh, even like in online sphere. Uh, the courses, Natalie, that you mentioned from them and University of Helsinki, are they on some course platform or on their websites? Uh, uh, yeah, you can use, uh, I can uh, share in the chat, uh, I will share links uh, in the chat. Uh, uh, the elements of AI is uh, free, Microsoft is also free, MIT is not free, but they are all online. They are all, all online and I will put uh, all the links now in the uh, chat uh, for all the participants uh, and also you uh, to be able to to uh, uh, access it and check it. Thanks a lot. We will incorporate that if, in our blog. If I may add to that. Go, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, for example, Microsoft also have this um, platform called Microsoft Learn. Uh, in which you have learning paths for different uh, technologies that Microsoft provides, especially in data science. So you can just put uh, in the research data science and then you have all the courses that Microsoft have tailored 
uh, for this. Uh, there's a lot of uh, collaborative platforms in which you can work on different uh, data projects called Kaggle.com, yes. um, with which you can really uh, like learn by doing. Um, otherwise, there's also Coursera. There are courses uh, by Andrew Yang, who, who is uh, who is a professor in Stanford. I did the courses; they are really good. Uh, for C levels, I think it's better to to know AI from a high level and not really look at the technical approach of it because it's not mm -hmm. really important. You have just to know how to adapt this technology to you to your to your business problematics and find the solution by knowing what the algorithms can do so there's also the influencer steve nuri who uh, always sharing uh, perspective and uh, articles about ai um, and that's pretty and there's also a blog called towards uh, data science uh, which mm -hmm. has a lot of uh, good material as well a lot. I think we have resources for the end of the summer, if not the end of the lockdown, <laughs> because we know summer is going to be like next two to three months. But for a lockdown, let's see. But just to add a bit of humor to our current situation. Thank you, ladies. Very, very, very appreciated. Um, so let's talk about ecosystems. Like you are active in, in your um, communities, but not just uh, only in the Balkans or in France, but you are well connected internationally. Uh, if you can share with us uh, some initiatives that you work on at the moment and how they contribute to, to AI. And the second thing is, uh, where do you see uh, further opportunities for collaboration when it comes to AI between NGOs, VC funds, startups, universities? Did you notice some interesting opportunities? Mm. Okay, shall I start? Okay, well, uh, as you mentioned in the introduction, I am engaged in uh, Data Science Serbia community. And uh, this is really now a six year uh, old community, has almost 3000 uh, people there. And what we are trying to do is now to uh, move from just providing uh, uh, technical material to connecting more to businesses so that we can uh, somehow uh, uh, create an environment where we can educate more businesses so that all these people that are in community can have better projects and better uh, and uh, can start working in these uh, companies. So this is one change that we made uh, in the last uh, year where we started uh, uh, being focused more also on, on businesses. Uh, it's very important to connect uh, different communities, uh, not only from this area, because you have a lot of different uh, in Serbia. You will have AI Serbia, you will have Lazy Brain, you will have Data Science Serbia. So all the different communities need to collaborate, but it's important to collaborate also with other, other uh, organizations, uh, um, uh, we are doing some things and trying to do some things with UNDP, for instance. Then I think that uh, in Serbia it's important to uh, to connect and, and uh, uh, a little bit uh, more pay attention to what Share Foundation is doing because Share Foundation is thinking about uh, other aspects of using data and technology, which sometimes can have negative impact on society and. And as community, we are now trying to create all these different different uh, points of contact and to help ev everyone find uh, uh, easier path to to uh, different uh, ecosystems. So uh, uh, it's not. Uh, I think that the time when we were just working in corporations and that was all our 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 uh, the whole network uh, has passed and that now uh, solutions that uh, we need for society or for companies require uh, much more diversity and this kind of diversity is very hard to get only through uh, regular hr process for instance uh, i think the community can really help in this regard to to businesses 
and uh, 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 the startup ecosystem in Serbia is rising when it comes to data science and AI applications. More and more companies, there are dozens of them already. Uh, some of them very, very successful already. Uh, and uh, uh, there are, um, I think that it's important that uh, government takes action more in this uh, regard. And they did now, uh, they created national AI strategy and action plan that will, that is corresponding to it. And hopefully this will engage a little bit more academia into AI research because in Serbia uh, it's not set up properly. You cannot really achieve a lot there. there, there uh, you don't have proper data infrastructure. You have problems with open data. You have open data as an initiative, but you don't have enough data so that you could actually do some, some projects. So there are a lot of areas where improvement is needed, but it at least we ha have now some kind of umbrella and some kind of national strategy, which hopefully will uh, bring, uh, bring in more, more uh, investments also into this area. For sure, there are a lot of people who want to uh, engage in this field. And like I said, uh, it's quite a strong community that we are having, having now. And I would add definitely every bit counts because it amplifies the signal that this topic is a priority and mm -hmm. Serbia and the region are engaged and we are serious about it. Because it's not just little initiatives that everybody's doing things on their own, but actually everybody's coming together at some mm -hmm. point. And thank you yeah. for sharing practical advice how to do that. Well, let's let's so let's hear what's going on in France. So, for me, yeah. it's been inspirational to hear about Station F, for example, how you adapted this as a big co-working space. Um, and what are some, some initiatives that we hear in France uh, when it comes to... So I'm going to start with my company and uh, Microsoft. So, for example, Microsoft, for startups in Europe, they, if you have a good business plan we can help you uh, build uh, your first application we can help you approach uh, potential customers uh, thanks to our ecosystem we provide technical resources um, even free cloud uh, and uh, access to partner channels so this is from for my company uh, but also as i said earlier President Macron wants to make uh, France uh, the Silicon Valley of Europe. So there's a lot of uh, work that has been done since three years ago uh, in this field. Uh, first um, of the initiatives is uh, La, Fran La French Tech, which is a movement funded by the government uh, that encourage and help uh, startups uh, in tech in France uh, and uh, make them whatever stage they are at uh, able to join this movement by having a lot of programs uh, for example there's the program french tech 120 that is specialized for uh, startups in hyper growth uh, it's supported by various governmental agencies public actors and they help uh, them uh, create uh, an international success there's also the tech visa of four years uh, for you and your family, if you want to establish a business in France, you can uh, come with this uh, visa and they help you also recruit the right talent in order to um, escalate uh, and make your business more known in France. Uh, there's also another organization uh, called France Digital, which is the number one organization of startups in Europe. I think it has more than 1,500 startups and investors and their goal is really to create the next digital champions uh, by providing a favorable uh, regulatory context uh, to the ecosystem. And they help them also uh, raise funds, uh, recruit the right talent, network with the right investors, and even know the peers on the field. Uh, there's also Station F, uh, which is a big hub for all startups but you have to apply in order to get in there uh, and they help you also find investors and make your business uh, more visible 
uh, to the ecosystem. So there's a lot of initiatives actually that has been taken place since three years ago here in France, uh, and uh, it's very promising. When I, when I listen to you, what I'm noticing and what really strikes me as positive is that not everything is focused on Paris. You're really building with like a national level. What and I'm happy that in Serbia we started doing things on a more regional level, let's say, and not everything is hosted in, in, in Belgrade and several university cities, but we see more local local initiatives uh, in different parts of the country and also in the Western Balkans region. Okay. Yeah, when you mentioned that, if I can add, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we that is one of the things that we are trying to do also with Data Science Serbia community. And last year we uh, even created like a road show through the through Serbia. I went to six different cities because we are trying to uh, uh, engage uh, people on a regional level because it's not good that everything is uh, centralized in Belgrade. There are great people uh, uh, in, in the country and we need to get them to this topic and to help them engage with it. Yeah. yeah. And now you reminded me of one, one observation of a friend of mine from like, we went to high school together and now he's quite, quite successful in data-driven work. And he said at some point, what is amazing is that many people get angry at some point, you know, when it comes to things like new country, institutions, etc. But not everybody keeps the positive attitude towards their city. So imagine if you create mm -hmm. you know, some, and in every city, like really, it becomes a smart city because a lot of smart people get affiliated with, um, and they want to contribute. Maybe it's a lecture in your former high school, or it's a uh, asking investor to to work with you, or it's uh, creating a data science hub, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So a lot of things can be done at the smaller units, um, which is yeah. Um, my final question before we open the floor for for several questions from the audience is like, how can each of us ensure that the AI of the future is less biased and more ethical? You mentioned like initiatives like Share Foundation, what they're doing, maybe maybe some of the points you, you have um, from your... Mm. Mm. Okay, well, I, I uh, think that uh, uh, we need, uh, if, uh, I think that corporate Corporations need to engage much more on this, and we as business leaders and managers uh, need to engage with topic of AI ethics uh, more. So it's not about individuals. Yes, individuals need to have uh, more knowledge and understanding of data and uh, algorithms, and they need to demand explainability and transparency of algorithms, and they need them to uh, to uh, uh, be vocal about it, to engage with different foundations, to, to demand from their regulator to regulate it. But a lot is on corporations and companies who are providing these uh, this, uh, services in which you have AI algorithms embedded. So I think that uh, as uh, leaders and managers, we have a responsibility to put the AI ethics as a priority in our companies. Uh, uh, and when I say that, I am talking about putting it on the board level, creating AI ethics committees, which will ensure that ethics, is, uh, ethics in, uh, in AI is embedded so that you design ethics in, in AI solutions immediately uh, and this uh, kind of uh, committee needs to act as advisory and governance body to oversee all AI uh, enabled uh, solutions. Uh, then we need to help developers, AI developers, understand the implications of AI algorithms and teach them how to test both data and algorithms against bias, against unfair uh, results and unfair treatment. And th this is not going to come uh, just uh, 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 if we let it go, it will not happen. We need to uh, point them into this direction. So we need to help them uh, understand this and 
provide them tools how to do it, to uh, check data against sensitive data, you know, correlation to see if there is some bias to test algorithms for bias to, uh, uh, to, to, to implement methods for auditing, for explaining how machine learning and other AI technologies are generating outputs. Uh, uh, there is one great example which I liked a lot when I read it uh, uh, from Telefonica, who is one of the leaders in telco, telco, telecommunication world. In 2018, they uh, uh, published their et AI, ethical, AI ethical pledge uh, and they uh, uh, committed to deploying artificial intelligence with integrity and transparency. Uh, uh, and uh, they were actually one of the first companies that uh, went openly uh, in the world and established these kind of principles. And I think that more companies need to do it. And uh, we as uh, professionals engaged with AI need to help uh, 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 our managers or our clients uh, to, to go into this direction. Thanks. And when you say like how, how, how actually deep understanding of AI helps us to, to, to be aware of the biases, somebody who maybe looks at the AI at the strategic level may not be aware of the yeah. fact that it may be biased towards some gender or some ethnical group or some age group because that person is looking at AI as a tool for solving a problem. But for, all, for those of you who are testing it or who are tweaking it, who understand it, it's crucial to, to have your voice and to be able to, to transfer this information. Um, Kulut, what would you add? Um, um, yeah, actually, I agree with Natalie, of course. Uh, and I think uh, transparent AI is explainable AI. So you have to yeah. be able to explain it to the customer how this AI model uh, had this decision. Like, how did he uh, do to in order to have uh, mm -hmm. this result? Um, and eventually, uh, you have to test thoroughly. Uh, you have to see uh, and know your data and see from the beginning if your data is biased or not, if you've taken this criteria into consideration with your model or not, uh, and eventually uh, having something that, uh, that doesn't take this uh, uh, into consideration uh, and have like less bias uh, result at the end. So it's a smart technique from the technical aspect because as she said earlier, when you are a C level, uh, at a C level, you wouldn't see what the algorithm did. You wouldn't notice actually what was done. So at first, from the first beginning, from the conception of the model, you have to take into consideration mm -hmm. all of the criteria. Great. Um, let's leave several minutes maybe for, for, for questions. Uh, and for me, the final question for you, what is your summertime message for young people starting out their career in tech? or maybe people who are interested in AI ML in particular. So there's a lot of time, exams are over, lockdown is here, um, but maybe we will also travel to some holidays, but what can be learned during summertime? Um, what is your summertime message? Hmm. Well, I actually cannot uh, put it as a summertime message. I think that uh, uh, that is the message uh, for, for, for the future. And it is that uh, digital world uh, means that you need to understand technology even if you are not a tech expert. We, uh, and that means that you will have to continuously learn, uh, 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 continuously get informed about new things, uh, try them, test them, and... and uh, and uh, ensure that you are relevant for the future, uh, that you stay relevant for the future. So uh, even if you do not start tech education or you do not work uh, uh, in this field, you need technology and you need to understand it because you will have better life uh, and uh, easier life and you will adapt better 
to everything that is going on if you are savvy with technology. I, I gotta be agreeing because that's how my career path evolved. Thank you. And it's eternal message indeed. Thanks. Well, yes, yeah, especially in the technology field, you have to always be curious because it's rapidly changing and you have to adapt to what the technology is providing right now. And you, you, you will have access to all information now through internet. Everything is, uh, is out there. So you have just to search for the information in order to, uh, to get more skills and be more effective in this field. Um, I don't see questions from the audience, so I would like to, to call it for today and to thank you once again for, for your, your fantastic input, a lot of ideas, uh, we will prepare blog and, and recordings so that others who didn't join us can also follow or get back to some advice. Um, thank you for your time and thanks to all of, us, all, all of the participants in our audience. Um, we will see you with next webinars uh, after the summer break in September, but until then, we will be sharing some excellent tools on, on our social media and through our newsletter. And let's let's stay tuned and let's see what everybody in the ecosystem is doing. We, we mentioned Serbia and France, and we hope to, to collaborate more with your initiatives as well. Thank you so much, Thank Milena. You. Thank you. It was great. Thank you, Milena. Thank you, Kaludu, also. It was thank a you, pleasure Natalia. meeting you and discussing with you. Yeah. Thank, thank you as well. Thank you. And thanks.